So Larry, I'm going to hand this off to Larry Madoff, who is, uh, again, somebody who in this audience needs no introduction, a professor of medicine and infectious disease guru, director of ProMed. And before I do, let me just kind of lay out a little bit of what the schedule looks like for the next couple of hours. This panel is going to go till 1245. Then we're going to take a lunch break. We'll have lunch. Um, we've built in a chunk of time during lunch because we have an amazing keynote during lunch. So after everybody grabs their food, we're going to have people come back. And Ron Klain uh, is going to be our lunchtime keynote. And I've seen him already. I know he's here. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and then we'll have one more panel in the afternoon so uh, after that and finish up. So that's the, that's the day. Um, but let me hand it over to Larry. <laughs> Thank you so much for uh, stewarding our ship. Thanks, Ashish, and, and thank you to um, the Harvard Global Health Institute, to Olga, to others who, who helped put all of this together. And it's, um, I, I came to the, to my first event was yesterday, uh, the, the vaccine symposium, and it was really amazing. And, it, um, and the uh, outbreak uh, DIY exhibit that, uh, that's at the back and in several other places um, in the building is really amazing, and thanks to um, Sabrina Schultz and the team from the Smithsonian for uh, bringing that here. Um, as um, as Sheesh mentioned, I, I, I have a couple of hats. I work um, in the um, Massachusetts Department of Public Health as the director of the Epidemiology and Immunization Division, and uh, also with uh, ProMed, the Program for Monitoring Emerging Diseases. And this symposium, this, uh, this session is about disease surveillance, and we're talking about conventional and emerging approaches. And what I, I think um, those, those refer to is traditional approaches to public health surveillance, um, which I'm, I'm quite familiar with from my role in the State Health Department. And, and those include largely um, information that's gleaned from the health system in one way or another. So information from hospitals and practitioners and laboratories and, and um, individuals filling out case report forms and, uh, and, and so forth. And, and you know, we at the state get a lot of that information electronically from you know, electronic laboratory reporting and from electronic medical records increasingly. Um, and then the other side of the coin is the kind of surveillance that, that ProMed has been doing, which is really surveillance from non-traditional sources, really um, information gleaned from outside of the, of the health system, if you will. And, and those include things like firsthand reports from clinicians in the field or from journalists, from the media. Um, from um, social media increasingly, from what's been referred to as big data, from the, the, the massive streams of information that are out there, um, you know, such as mining Google search terms for, for, with Google flu trends. Um, and these non-traditional or, or informal sources of information are increasingly important for understanding, for, for detecting disease outbreaks rapidly. And, and they complement one another. And the distinctions are not always um, complete, by the way. For, for example, in the public health system, as I suspect Nancy will, will talk about, we're, we're seeing more and more innovative strategies for mining information from non-traditional sources. Um, we at the health department just had a, a fantastic collaboration with um, Pardis Sabeti's group um, here at Harvard and at the Broad Institute looking at mumps genomic data as a way of monitoring and, and understanding an outbreak of, um, of, of mumps happening um, here in, in Massachusetts um, in, the, in, in recent years. And so there, there is, um, and, and, and governments and, and others, partly as part of the, of the um, global health security agenda and the JEE, have been adopting event-based surveillance strategies to monitor emerging diseases in, in, in non-traditional ways. Um, and, uh, and so increasingly, um, these, we're, we're seeing, seeing overlap and, and between these realms. But we have a, a really um, interesting panel here 
today, and uh, Nancy Messonnier from, from CDC is going to lead us off. And I'm going to ask the speakers to come up here. They're going to speak um, for, for their five to eight minutes. Some, some have slides, some don't. And then afterwards, we'll invite um, questions from the panelists to each other and uh, from you all. So thank you. Great. Well, uh, thanks for being here. It's been an actually really exciting morning so far. And it does feel like we're kind of changing pace a little bit to go back and talk about surveillance and data, which um, feels much less exciting in some ways than talking about all the outbreaks. But obviously, it's very connected. Um, CDC has hundreds of streams of data coming in in any given day. State and local health department data from the National Notifiable Disease Surveillance System is really key to our understanding of infectious diseases. But we also have annual surveys like the National Immunization Survey and the Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance System. And we have laboratory data, including flu surveillance data from around the globe, which gives us um, sequences incredibly important to understanding flu transmission and also vaccine development and tissue samples from unexplained deaths. So we have hundreds of streams of data coming in and it's really grown organically. If you were to start over again from scratch and wipe it all out and build surveillance for the US or any country, you wouldn't build it this way. You'd build a highly integrated system of surveillance where all the data comes from all these streams and comes together in a way that's interconnected and translatable and where everybody in the country can get access to it and do lots of interesting analyses. So certainly it's not an optimal system and a big emphasis now in public health is figuring out how to do, be more efficient with our gathering of surveillance data. As you think about surveillance and data, though, it's also really important to think about the context in which we collect that data. As data becomes more visible and available to the public, um, we need to transmit to them also understanding of the context of that data. Otherwise, it can be misinterpreted. So a perfect example of that is last flu season. It was a terrible flu season, um, 80,000 deaths. 180 of those in children. But what got into the news early on was an expectation that the vaccine wouldn't work very well because of data from um, Australia. Now, 40% efficacy of a flu vaccine to a uh, general public doesn't sound really good. Why would I bother getting a vaccine that's only 40% effective? But those of us who do public health understand that a 40% effective vaccine is much more effective against deaths, and it means for an individual that their risk of serious disease is much less. But that number, that surveillance number, an isolation can really be misinterpreted. Similarly, um, a couple years ago, there was a large outbreak of measles associated with people visiting Disney in California. Families were actually really surprised to find out that there was under vaccination in their school system and their communities, that their children were at risk for measles because of the decisions that their neighbors made about whether to vaccinate their own kids. So data can be really powerful and really be helpful in understanding your own context. Public has an expectation nowadays that they're actually going to see raw data. And there is a risk in that unless it's appropriately interpreted. Um, we really also have started to take for granted the availability of data from social media and sort of the surround sound now that makes data at our fingerprints. Um, people also really take for granted that, for example, they can show up at a local Target or CVS and get access to a vaccine, a flu shot. But data can be really powerful in everyday lives and helping people make decisions. For example, people have gone to the um, pharmacy expecting to be able to get a Zoster shot, only to find out that the pharmacy sold out because there's been a run on Zoster. And despite what we understand about the availability of vaccines, you might be surprised to find out that immunization coverage is actually lower in rural areas because people actually have difficulty accessing the vaccines in rural areas, including HPV vaccine. So what we need to be able to do is take the data that's coming to us and put it um, in the right public health context so people can make decisions at an individual level, so clinicians can make decisions, but also so that policymakers can see how, the, how all that data comes together and help make decisions. The power of the data that's available now is not in those individual streams, but in us being able to integrate those streams at every level of the population. And that's really what we're working on now. And I'll give an example maybe about flu data. 
we get an incredible number of feeds of flu data and on Friday at around now, if you go to the CDC website, you can see FluView, which is our interpretation of the weekly data that's available for flu disease data throughout the US because unfortunately for influenza, you can't use a single data feed to understand what's going on with flu. You have to look at multiple data sources to really get an understanding. But wouldn't you rather see that data integrated into a single platform and loaded on top of that data, flu vaccination coverage data, as well as data on whether flu vaccine is available, maybe whether antivirals are available, and also what hospital preparedness looks like in your region. Last year, during the bad flu outbreak, hospitals were overrun, and some hospitals actually had to put patients in the hallways. Wouldn't it be helpful as a policymaker, as a public health person, to be able to see the lens of flu disease also with that layered on top? Um, in addition, one of the things that we at public health in general aren't great at yet is also figuring how to synthesize and use all the rest of the demographic data that is not health data to really understand the communities that we're serving. So you take the flu surveillance data, you layer onto it data on flu vaccination coverage, you layer onto it data on the availability of vaccine and antivirals, but you also layer onto that socioeconomic data so that you can understand the community around it. Is it, a, is it a community with lots of underserved people? Is it a community where childhood vaccination coverage is low so we know that there's likely to be distrust of vaccines? All that information would make it incredibly more powerful on a seasonal flu basis, but in the setting of a pandemic or some kind of emergency, it would really make it much easier for us to do our jobs, which is really about using the data to make decisions about how we use our resources and how we communicate to the public about what we think they should do. So my talk was supposed to be about traditional surveillance, but I think what I'm saying is that, you know, the traditional surveillance is very powerful, but really we see in the near term um, a revolution coming, and we at public health tend to sort of be on the outside of that revolution, not really in the center of it, thinking about how best to harness the data. It's really time for us to change that equation and think up front about this data and how it could be best used. Thank you.